join me in the responsive call to worship. My heart is steadfast, O God, my heart is steadfast. Awake, my soul. Awake, O harp and lyre, I will awake the dawn. For your steadfast love is as high as the heavens, your faithfulness extends to the clouds. May grace and peace be yours this day in abundance in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. The hymn is number 318, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. have searched me and known me. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. You look for a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord. You know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, that I am very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Let us now come to God, a God who knows us through and through and yet loves us and promises to forgive us and renew us. Let us pray together. The prayer of confession. Merciful God, you know us through and through. The depths of our hearts are known to you. 
nothing is hidden. So you already know that sometimes we fo focus on the rules of religion and pay little attention to our relationship with you. We give lip service to our faith, but often neglect to give our lives in loving service to our neighbors. Our outward appearance often masks our innermost thoughts. Sometimes we even try to hide the truth from ourselves. So help us now to see ourselves as you see us. Help us to come to you, open and receptive, no longer needing to pretend and cover up. Come to our defenseless hearts and transform them by your love. Come, Lord Jesus, and make our hearts your home. words from Psalm 103. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. God does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is God's steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far, he removes our transgressions from us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel and live in peace. Amen. together say what we believe in the words of the Apostles Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Hymn is numbered 486, Open My Eyes That I May See. Thank you.
Now for the prayer for illumination. Guide us now, O Lord, by your word and Holy Spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now for the scripture reading, it's from Luke chapter 14, verses 25 to 33. Now large crowds were traveling with him, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to wage war against another king will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So, therefore, None of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. So ends the reading. Thanks be to God. This story from Luke begins on such a positive and hopeful note. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. You would think that that would be a welcome sign of success and potential for the, the Jesus movement, a kind of validation of Jesus' ministry. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem He's attracted a large and enthusiastic following. He should be feeling very encouraged by that. All the signs are pointing toward success. But Jesus was never very impressed by crowds. In fact, he often wanted to, seemed to want to thin out the crowds that followed him. Maybe, to Jesus' mind, a large following probably meant that a lot of these folks really didn't know what they were doing in hitching their wagons to his star. Luke tells us that large crowds were traveling with Jesus. But then Jesus immediately turns to that same throng of followers to say some things that would discourage them. Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and yes, even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. And then he goes on to tell two kind of mini parables about counting the cost and thinking carefully in advance before you undertake a major project. It's almost as if Jesus is chiding the people who were following him for not having a clue as to what they were really doing. That they were the ones who were not counting the cost ahead of time. That these were the people who had to abandon a building project before it was finished because they ran out of resources. That they were the people who had gone to war against a superior opponent without thinking about whether they were strong enough 
to confront their enemy. Why does Jesus say these things? Why does he seem to be throwing cold water on the enthusiasm of those who wanted to follow him? Part of the answer is that when Jesus talks about hating father and mother, brothers and sisters, he's using a figure of speech common to the culture. It was a figure of speech which meant to turn away from, to detach oneself from it. The word there for, that is translated hate carries nothing of the connotation, the emotional kind of negativity of I hate you. And when Jesus talked about hating your own life, it's not self-loathing, but rather again, the kind of detachment and, and letting go. He's emphasizing that discipleship is a matter of priorities, of choosing one thing above all the others. And that means letting go of some things. And that in the network of the many loyalties in which we live, among the many people and causes and pleasures that call for our time, our attention and allegiance, the claims of Jesus take precedence. And not only take precedence, but they redefine all the other claims on our lives. To follow Jesus means that sometimes our loyalty is not to God and country, but sometimes it's God or country. Sometimes we have to make a choice. Because Jesus Christ is Lord, when I go to vote, I need to ask myself, not am I better off than I was two years ago or four years ago? That's really a selfish question. But I need to ask, which policies, which candidates will be better? Not just for me and my family, not just for America, but for this world which God loves, and especially those who are often without power or influence or wealth. To follow Jesus means that sometimes is, our, our devotion is not just towards Jesus and family values, but maybe Jesus or family. It may mean that my son or daughter may not have all that they want. It may mean that sometimes they have to go without the, the latest toys or the best clothing because some of my income, some of my resources are devoted to helping refugees or feeding the hungry. Because these people too are God's well-loved children no less deserving than my own flesh and blood. Those are relatively small sacrifices compared to what many have given up. And maybe they're even small sacrifices compared to what you have given up or will give up in order to be faithful to Jesus. But to become a disciple of Jesus is to have your heart enlarged and your vision broadened the center of concern is no longer just myself, my family, my country. It's bigger than that. And I think Jesus tells us these things because Jesus is honest. This is what discipleship involves. This is the way the world is. And therefore, you need to think about the cost and consider carefully what you're doing. Jesus refuses to make, to, to make the way sound easier than it is. He wants us to know very clearly what we're getting into, so no one follows him under false pretenses. Discipleship costs. If the world were different than it is, Maybe following Jesus would be a lot easier. But that's not the way the world is. And the world is often unkind toward those who set out to follow Jesus. You know, sometimes the church makes it sound like um, Jesus is the one who came to help us in our relationship, uh, to improve our marriage, 
to make us happier at, at work, to help us through tough times. And that's, that's all true, of course. The one who talked about giving up possessions and turning away from those who are dear to us also said, come to me, you who are overburdened, and I will give you rest. But we also need to remember that Jesus came not just to make us happier or more joyful or to make our lives better, but he came to change us, came to change the world, and to call you and me to be a part of that transformation. Following Jesus is about living in such a different way that the rest of the world will find you at least odd and perhaps maybe a threat. And Jesus wants us to know that. And to some people, the Christian faith is all about asking, how can God enrich my life and help me meet my goals? How will my faith in God make me a happier, more successful, and more satisfied person? Jesus, on the other hand, would press us to ask, how can I bring my life in tune with God's will for me and for the world? And I think Jesus also tells us these things because he is loving. He knows that having a little bit of faith in God on the side while continuing with your normal, comfortable, satisfied life just doesn't work. No one can serve two masters, he said. A house divided against itself will not stand. You can't just go on as it is and say, I'll take God in my life when it's needed, when it helps me. So perhaps in some ways we may need to make it harder and not easier for people to become part of Christ's church. At least we need to be upfront with people and need to ask them, are you sure you really want to do this? Because it's going to cost you. You know, the traditional liturgy for baptism begins with what are known as the renunciations and affirmations. A recognition that saying yes to Jesus means saying no to some other things. And the first question that's asked in the liturgy is, do you renounce the power of evil in your life and in the world? And we should think about that and maybe even think about how it could be made more specific and more clear. Do you renounce your family, your possessions, your ego? Will your love and loyalty to Jesus come first? Will you let that love and commitment shape your relationship to your possessions, to your family, to your own needs, and not the other way around? In, in one of Ann Tyler's novels it's called Saint Maybe, 19-year-old Ian tells his parents that he's decided to leave college and take a job as an apprentice cabinet maker because he wanted to help raise the children of his brother who had passed away. And Ian has arrived at this decision because of the influence of his pastor and the church where he is a member. It's called the Church of the Second Chance. The congregation of the Church of the Second Chance has promised to help him with this as he juggles the demands of his new job and responsibility for his brother and sister-in-law's children. But that decision alarms Ian's parents. Ian, have you fallen into the hands of some kind of sect, they ask him? No, I haven't, said Ian. It's just I discovered a church that makes sense to me. The same as Dover Street Presbyterian Church makes sense to you and mom. 
Well, Dover Street didn't ask us to abandon our educations, his mother tells him. Of course, we have nothing against religion. We raised all of our children to be Christians, but our church never asked us to abandon our entire way of life. Well, maybe it should have, he said. Two churches, two kinds of Christianity. Dover Street Presbyterian Church supports people in their current way of life, provides a kind of chaplaincy service for their religious needs and rituals. But the Church of the Second Chance goes beyond that and challenges that way of life. It offers an alternative and promises to be with you in that struggle. One church asks little of its members, maybe communicating their, that there really isn't much stake in the kind of faith they foster. They don't have much power to transform lives because they don't expect it. Just a little bit of God on the side to help me get through life as it is. But the other expects that an encounter with a living God will change you. That this God isn't safe or predictable or always comforting, but this is a God who has the power to change us and change the world and who just might ask us to abandon our current way of life to join God in this transformation. You know, I find that Often, in my prayers, they kind of devolve into a to-do list for God. God, help me with this. God, help this person. God, be present in this situation. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, Jesus said, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. But maybe in our prayers, we also need to ask, instead of, Jesus, I want you to do this for me, instead ask, Jesus, what is it you are asking me to do? How are you asking me to change? What do I need to give up in order to be a more faithful follower of you? Jesus, what do you want me to do? And then let that question shape our life that day. Uh, not only, Jesus, help me do this, but where are you leading me? What do you want me to be or do today? And what do I need to give up in order to be your faithful follower? What do I need to, to let go of? Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you love us as you are, as we are. But you also love us enough to want to change us. Keep your Holy Spirit with us and keep our hearts and minds attentive to what you are saying and what you are calling us to be and to do. Amen. Let us continue to worship God with our gifts.
We thank you, O oh God, that you have blessed us with these gifts, that everything we have is a gift from your hand. We thank you that we are invited to share those gifts with you and with others. Bless these gifts now, we pray. Send them on errands of mercy and justice that other lives, too, might be touched with your love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us be joined together in prayer. <clears throat> Eternal God, our loving parent, you long to gather all your children in your loving embrace. You are God who feeds the hungry and satisfies the thirsty. You befriend the lonely and travel with those who are desperate. You comfort those who mourn. You lift us up when we are low, and your power humbles us when we are proud. Your strong love strengthens us when we are afraid, and your peace calms us when we are embattled. Your love for us endures even though we often test you at every turn. Your patience outlasts our stubbornness. Your love is stronger than our sin. And you understand the pain that drives us to despair, the concern for the child who goes another way, the parent who will not let a child grow up, a spouse who has rejected us, the friend who drinks too much, the partner who dies. You know us, you understand us, and you love us. We thank you for that love so deep, so broad, so high, that you should empty yourself and become one with us becoming servant of all, even to the point of death and death on a cross. Give us grace, O God, to let your love into our lives, to be guided and molded and transformed by love so that we too might reflect the compassion we have known in Jesus Christ. Give us the grace of stretch out our arms and embrace and welcome in your name all those whom you Give us the courage to be beacons of welcome in the darkness of a voice of gentleness amid the hard noises of this world and an outstretched hand of love to those who are looking for community that we might welcome in Christ's name, all those you send us. O oh God, who longs to gather your people in the wide embrace of your love, we pray for those who are longing for a new beginning, for those who are without homes this day. For those who are imprisoned, for those who are estranged from their families and loved ones, for those who have left loved ones behind. For those who are grieving loss, for those who are ill, for those who are facing treatment and need courage and patience and hope. 
Give them all new life by the power of your Spirit and help us to see how we can be present with them. God of the nations, we pray for peace, for peace in our own country and for peace in the world. Be with those who are working among the nations as diplomats, diplomats and service workers. We pray for the people of Ukraine. For other places in our world where there is strife. And we pray for those who are working to heal the wounds of the past, to overcome the barriers of fear, to bring justice to those who are oppressed. Give them wisdom and patience. Keep them safe in the midst of conflict and save them from discouragement. And help us to support them with our prayers and our gifts and our voices. Oh God, make us instruments of your peace. Wherever you send us. That through our words and actions and thoughts. We might reflect the love of Jesus. Who is the Prince of Peace. And who taught us to pray together saying. Our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The hymn is numbered 520. Lord, dismiss us with thy blessing. Thank you. peace to love and serve the Lord, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.